see you all along here. Not, not a bad crowd, and I know there's another meeting on somewhere around here, but actually we shouldn't expect to have too many more people at meetings like this anyway. Because you see, uh, when you become a born-again Christian in today's world, very sadly, when you become a born-again Christian, a true born-again Christian, uh, you become part of a remnant group. It's not a very large group of those who are really born again. But when you become a born-again Christian who uh, has a revelation and a love for Israel, you become a remnant group inside a remnant group. Yeah. And then when you become a born-again Christian who has a love for Israel and, uh, and actually does something about it, you become a remnant group inside a remnant group inside a remnant group. And to take it one step further, and I know it probably applies to most of us here tonight, let me see if I can get it all out. <laughs> if when you become a true born again believer, shall we say, who has a love for Israel, does something about it, and also has a love for God's word and his Torah, yeah. you become a remnant group inside a remnant group inside a remnant group. <laughs> so actually, the number of people we've got here tonight, it's a blooming miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God that we're actually here. Kamatov, Hazdecha, Adonai, we're only here in that, in that situation because God has, has opened our eyes to see the truth and to understand you know, what, is, what his word is best we can. And he's, we're all in process, I know, but uh, just to have a, at least a little bit of revelation about what his word and what the Bible is, is really all about. Now, the... Um, <clears throat> the uh, the title for the meeting tonight was Israel, the key to the kingdom. I kind of gave that to Jill just as a generic, <coughs> as a generic thing, because when I start, kind of when we set meetings up a few months ahead, you never know what's going to happen when you're dealing with Israel. So I don't like to lock myself into uh, into anything. Uh, so I kind of give out these generic titles. So I walked in, I said, "Oh, what did I? What, what did we say?" <laughs> so she tells me that, and I, I actually had something else in mind. But anyway, in the worship, the Lord was giving me all this other stuff. And so let's see, Father, help me to put this all together and help me to get it from wherever it is spinning around in my head to get it out and into our hearts. In the name of Yeshua, amen? amen. So Israel, uh, the key to the kingdom. And I believe that is the absolute truth. And I, I actually did preach a message years ago called Israel to the keys, the key to the kingdom. I can't even remember what I used to speak about in those days, but it was probably some of the things I'll, I'll share just now. I'm going to try and get this out as quickly as possible, and then we can have a time of... Uh, Q and A, um, but I believe that Israel is the key to the kingdom of God, and I would take that from uh, let me see, uh, Acts chapter three verse twenty one, I think it is, yep, Acts three twenty one, where it says that the Lord must remain in heaven. Some versions say heaven is holding him or restraining him until the time of the restoration of all of the words that God spoke through the mouth of the holy prophets since the world began. And if we, if we take our time uh, uh, to read the books of the prophets, we will see that they were speaking to uh, ancient Israel. And they warned us, they said, if you guys don't obey the voice of the Lord your God, uh, you're out of here. And uh, we failed to heed the warning. We were sent to Babylon for 70 years for not keeping the Shemitah and other things. And uh, then God allowed us, or some of us, to come back. We still didn't learn our lesson. <clears throat> Most of the Jewish people... Uh, failed to recognize when the Messiah arrived. And uh, uh, 40 years later, the Romans came in, they destroyed Jerusalem and much of Israel, and we were cast out, this time not just to one nation, we were cast to the north, the south, and even to the ends of the earth, which is how come I got born in New Zealand, right? It's all funny. <laughs> uh, but each of the prophets also said, in the latter days or at the end of the age, uh, God will bring you back from the north, the south, and from all of the places where he scattered you. And I think most of us recognize the fact that uh, today in Israel there's uh, uh, close to 7 million Jewish people who have come back from every corner of the earth, including uh, a small number of families from, from New Zealand. And they're still coming home at, uh, what's it, Josie, 800, 900? About 800 and 900 a week. And of course it's on the increase because uh, over the last... I don't know, since maybe, let's just say 2006, I think that was when, or actually even, let's go back to 2005. The Gaza withdrawal, then we had the Lebanon war in 2006, we had the Gaza war in 2008, we had the Mavi Marama incident, and when was that, 2011 or 12? 
Uh, then we had another, the, the Lebanon, another Lebanon war, and the, the Gaza war. No, there wasn't another Lebanon war. There was the Gaza war last year. And, of course, it was in this time zone of the four red moons, the Shemitah year. And uh, there was a lot of, of course, there was a lot of discussion and argument in the church about the Shemitah, about the four red moons. Uh, and, of course, we just had the fourth moon, and it was the only one that was red in Israel. And less than a week later, yeah. we find ourselves with all hell broken loose, and Israelis are not safe anywhere in the country right now. That's how they feel. Like they're not. They're, 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 we got a report today: the the, 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 the cafes, the restaurants, the nightclubs, all in, in uh, Jerusalem, but even down in Tel Aviv, they're empty because they, the Israelis are afraid to go out. We're not safe in our bus stops. We're not safe in the in the buses. We're not safe walking down the street. It's terrible. And of course, it's 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 happened just after this this fourth red moon. The the whole Arab world is fizzing, I believe. It. They're just itching to have another go at Israel. And I'm going to explain why that isn't in a few minutes when I get to it, if I get to it. <laughs> um, but I believe that uh, the, according to Acts chapter 3, 21, uh, the Lord will not return to the earth. Heaven's holding him. Heaven is restraining him, it says, until God has completed this restoration process with Israel. So um, just to kind of cut it short a little bit, um, just keeping in mind what's going on in the land at the moment and what's been happening there really since 2005, 2006, and this, this, rise, this dramatic rise of anti-Semitism all over the world, particularly in Europe. And uh, this may sound like a strange thing for uh, a Jewish person to say, but you know, we don't pray against anti-Semitism. And if you pray, if you're praying against the anti-Semitism, please stop. Because uh, you know, generally speaking, people don't get up and leave a place where they are living en masse if life is good. Mm. And we saw it in the 90s. As communism fell, uh, the ruble went down dramatically. As the ruble went down, the anti-Semitism went up. And as the anti-Semitism went up, the number of Jews coming to Israel from the former Soviet Union rose proportionately to the point that it was a thousand a day. A thousand Jewish people every day pouring through the gates of Ben Gurion Airport. And uh, a million came in 10 years, 25% of the country. Uh, their mother tongue is Russian. Now, uh, it's slowed down to, you know, like to 800 to 900 uh, a, a week now. And they're not just coming from Russia, they're coming from South America, they're coming from France, they're coming from all over the world, and it's on the increase. Uh, correct me if I get my <coughs> statistics wrong, but since the, since the, uh, in, in fact it happened really after the first red moon, back in Passover 2014, just a few weeks later, maybe four or five weeks, and these things don't have to happen on the day, it's just, it's just a time zone. And with six weeks after the first red moon, the uh, Gaza war broke out. And as a result of that Gaza war, and Israel having to go in and deal with the situation, because they were firing rockets at us, um, the level of hatred and the level of anti-Semitism just it spiked. It went through the roof. And it was bad before, <laughs> but now it, I mean, it, it rose significantly because of Israel having to go out and deal with the situation. And... Uh, you know, most of you probably know I wrote this book called A Slow Train Coming. Can you uh, put my PowerPoint on quickly? If you can, it doesn't matter if you can't, but it'll illustrate the point. And slide number five. So the, the book, I wrote this book about 10 or 12 years ago, and it's based on a train map that we'll try and get on. Most of you have seen it. Anyway, there's free copies on the back table. It's got a number of stations down the track. And, uh, you know, every few years I pick my book up and I think, well, I better read it and maybe I need to update it. So I start reading it. And I think, no, no, it's okay. But I believe that as a result, that's our, that's our house next door. <laughs> and number five, just, just go down a few. One more, that, that one there. So, um, we're, we're somewhere down towards the end of it, between 1997 and, 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 and the question marks, and that's when the Lord comes back. But we felt that as a result of the Gaza war last year, something shifted. There was a shift in the natural and in the spiritual realm. And actually, I believe that. I haven't done it yet, but I believe I should put another station on the track for 2014. Because I believe when the, when the train passed through that, through July and August last year, we passed a significant point in God's plan. 
And what it was, of course, it was this increase of anti-Semitism and hatred for Israel and the Jewish people, and also an increase of political pressure on our Prime Minister and upon our government, basically to bow down to the dictates of the Muslim world. And so we need to pray for our Prime Minister as well. So I haven't put the station on the track, but I really, I mean, I'm serious. I really believe we, we passed a significant point. And if there's anything I should change, I think I should change the title. Because it's not a slow train anymore. This is the bullet train. This is the TBR. This train is hurtling down the tracks. And we haven't got far to go because we're almost at the end of the journey. And now this train is racing down the tracks at breakneck speed. And I'll tell you two things about the train, brothers and sisters. Number one, it doesn't have brakes. It's not going to slow down. And number two, it doesn't have reverse gear. This train is not going to go backwards. We are, we are hurtling down this track of God's plan. And we're almost at the very end of this journey. And it's only going to accelerate. And we need to be ready for that. So let's just quickly get back to the anti-Semitism. Um, because of what's happened, because where we are in time, this level of hatred uh, is causing this, you know, the anti-Semitism is causing the Jewish people to, uh, you know, to, to, to think seriously about coming back to Israel. Seventy percent of French Jews have made inquiries at their synagogue over the last 12 months uh, about making Aliyah, coming back to the land. Uh, last year, the number of French Jews doubled. Right, Josie, just tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, but she's the expert on this subject. Uh, and, and they're expecting a doubling again this year of French Jews coming back to Israel. There are headlines in European papers, Jewish life in Europe is over, which on one hand is terrible, but then on the other hand, if you go back to Acts chapter 3, verse 21, it's good news. And you know, over the last year or so, as we've had those terrible, particularly in France and Belgium, where there was you know, Jewish people dying in terror attacks, our Prime Minister stood up publicly and said, hey, it's okay, don't worry, we've got a place for all of you. In Israel. And the rabbis, the rabbis of, of these places, and the prime ministers or the president said, Oh no, we don't want our Jews to leave, we want to keep them here. Now, it's very nice that someone would like us that much that they want us to stay, because it's not normal. <laughs> but God says, I want them, I don't want them in France or England or anywhere else, I want them back in Israel. Because that's part of what the prophecies are about. That's part of what is required to take place before heaven releases Yeshua to come. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 8 to 10. God says, uh, I will bring all of the house of Israel, all of it, twice in one verse. Now, whatever God says in his word, obviously, he's serious about. But when he says the same thing twice in one verse, I think he's very serious. In fact, I think he's very, 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 very serious. In uh, Ezekiel 30. Uh, let me get it right, 39, I think it is, verses 27, 28, 29. He says, I will leave none of my people captive in the nations any longer. You know, Jewish people, I'm not sure if there's any other Jewish people here tonight. Um, but Jewish people, we're supposed to feel like aliens in a foreign land when we're not living in the land of Israel. And you know, I've had Jewish people in my meetings get up and walk out. When I've said what I'm going to say now, I believe that Jew... Are there, are there any Jewish people here tonight? Okay, good, I can say it. <laughs> well, I'd say it anyway, actually. Um, you know, actually, Jewish people who don't live in Israel are covenant breakers. Because God made a covenant with Abraham for his descendants to live in Wales, right? No. England. No. Where? Israel. And in fact, even in Ezekiel 36 or 37, God says, when the Jewish people live outside of the land, they profane my name. God is very serious. He wants us back in the land. So uh, don't pray against anti-Semitism, brothers and sisters, because God is using it. And it's the only thing. It's, it's only when life gets difficult, when life gets uncomfortable, that uh, the Jewish people you know, get up and, and go back to where they belong. Now, we can, of course, pray that no one gets harmed. And no one gets injured. And just, you know, God says in his word, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whistle for my people. So what we should be doing is, Father, pr turn the heat up. Yeah. Again, don't let anyone get harmed. But Father, turn the heat up. Whistle louder, Lord. And take the earplugs out so they can hear you whistling. But praise God, seven million have heard it. And there's still now this, this, this 
uh, Aliyah is on the increase, and we believe we're going to see it increase more and more because this thing's not going to go away. It's going to get worse. And even what's happening now in Israel, it's going to cause another spike or another rise. And it's because the news media is continuing to make Israel look bad. And they spike. I mean, just for an example, uh, the, uh, well, um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas said that um, the Israeli soldiers killed and uh, executed, he, he used the word, executed a 13-year-old boy involved in some kind of, I, can't, I don't remember the details, no, in some kind of incident. And of course, the news media all over the world picks that up and, and, and publishes it. Well, uh, yesterday the Israelis discovered the boy in a hospital alive. Did, did you read that in your paper today? Or did you, hear, did you see that on your news tonight? They're not going to report that. Because, you know, if you think about it, the last time there was a major attempt to destroy the Jews, it was in uh, Hitler's Nazi regime, right? And Hitler used the news media to poison a whole nation, or almost a whole nation of decent people, to either stand by or participate as genocide took place right before their very eyes. And that was in 1939 to 45. They had um, newspapers, they had radio, and they used to use, they, before the movies, at the cinema, they used to show uh, documentaries, and Hitler used all of those things to, 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 to deceive a whole nation, almost a whole nation of decent people to get involved in genocide. But today, think about it. How much more powerful is the media today? Everybody's so tuned in. Where were we? we? You, know, you said about everybody sitting with their faces and their phones, checking the... Wherever you go. People are on their iPads or they've got their faces on their phones checking the news or, or receiving information. And most of it is wrong information. Yeah. Now, there's, a, there's another key for the church, of course, of the true church. We need to get onto these things like, like Stefan's doing with the ministry Amen. in Israel. It's called One for Israel, if you want to check that out. But they are using everything that's available to reach as many people as they can. And if you do it right and the anointing is upon it, it works. Because I said we sat with one of them in the sukkah. <laughs> <laughs> about two weeks ago. So, um, but it, but uh, the trouble is, the young, again, the young people are so exposed to what do they call it? So, what do they call it? Social, social media, social media, social networking, yeah. and most of what they're receiving is wrong. So, those of us who know the truth, we've got to do everything we can and pour every resource we've got into trying to counter counteract the lies of the enemy. But we've got to ace up our sleeve, right? His name's Yeshua, or the Ruach HaKodesh, God, the God of Israel. And when you've got God on your side, you're on the winning team, right? <laughs> He's the majority of one. And when you've got God, when you're working with God, you don't need anybody else. So, we, of course, we can use these, this modern day stuff, but with, with the anointing of God and with, with the wisdom of the Lord and the technology that, you know, I believe that the technology, well, the technology that we have it's all a part of the end time things because the, the end time prophecies can't come to pass without this kind of technology that's available. And it's here. We're living in it. We've got it all. It's all set up. We're just, we, you know, again, we're just, we're just a little bit away from the end of this journey. Uh, the prophets also spoke about uh, all Israel being saved. And again, we've got a growing number of congregations in Israel. Uh, all over the world, and encyclopedias are, are quoting anywhere from half a million to one million Messianic Jews in the world today. There's probably more, because I believe there's a lot of people sitting in churches who are Jewish and don't even, some of them know it and don't say so. Actually, you like this one, Mike. Um, on Tuesday, we're going to Cambridge, right? And there's a sister there, she's part of a three-church di Anglican diocese. So she, she, she asked her, the, the, the main vicar, if that's what you call it, if all of the people from the three dioceses could come to the, a meeting at her, uh, she's got a really big house. Uh, and uh, so the vicar looked up our website, so she, so she wrote, she called me, or she wrote me an email, and I think I called her on the phone, and I said, what's happening with the meeting? She said, oh, it's not good news. She said, the vicar called me up, he said, he took a look, look at your website, and he muttered something about Zionists, and said, the people can't come. Oh. That's bad, right? We all know what's really bad. The guy's a Jew. <laughs> He's a Jew. <laughs> And we tried to get a cup of have a, have a, have a morning, at least morning tea with because Josie wanted to get on him and get a, give him a hard time, but he, he made a good excuse that he's out of town, but uh, saved his, his skin. But uh, I mean, that's how bad it is. It's, it's unbelievable. 
But it's only, it's only going to get worse. Anyhow, there's at least a million, I believe there's at least a million Jews, could probably many, many more sitting in churches who either know it and keep it quiet or don't know it at all. And of course it's increasing, particularly in Israel. Uh, most of the congregations are involved in the outreach of people. That, you know, the congregations are multiplying and the congregations are growing in size. And so God, you can see God is at work. And of course the other thing that God is doing, He's... Um, Restoring the apostolic calling on Israel. Because, see, I believe that Israel was called to be an apostolic nation at Mount Sinai. We were called to be an apostolic nation. We were called to be a light and a blessing to the nations. And, you know, before the days of the internet, the only way that you could be a light to the nations or fulfill that, or fulfill that calling was to actually go to the nations. Now, of course, uh, I can sit at home and I send out my news report to, I don't know, 14 or 15,000 people. Uh, every Friday. It takes me all day to do it, but anyway, it gets there in the end. So I, I can actually fulfill that apostolic calling from, you know, from, my, uh, from my office desk with my laptop. But uh, you know, God's a relational God. And for, you know, some of you know, for the last 15 years I've been, uh, you know, I've been uh, flying around the earth, traveling on trains and roads and buses and, uh, well, that's probably about it. <laughs> Uh, just trying to do what, you know, trying to fulfill this calling that God has placed on us. And, you know, it, it burns in my bones. And like, uh, you know, Josie doesn't quite understand it because she, she hasn't got that same calling. But you know, if I've been home for more than three or four weeks, I start to shake. Because I'm going through apostolic withdrawal. <laughs> and you know, I don't like titles. And a lot of Christians today, a lot of people in the ministry, they, they, they uh, you know, they put their name on their calling card and... You know, John Smith Apostle, or John Smith Prophet, or John Smith whatever. You know, it's not what you write on your business card that makes you what you are. It's what you actually do. And if you really are a prophet or an apostle, you don't have to go putting it on your business card, because people will know it by the fruit of your life. Amen. Um, and I've, got, I've been called pastor and rabbi and, and professor, and uh, I've been called some things I can't mention in, in mixed company. <laughs> um, and I, mean, I don't feel comfortable with any of those, because I'm just me, right, David? But over the last couple of years, as this thing has been kind of percolating in my spirit, I have really begun to feel comfortable seeing Out of Zion Ministries as, as an apostolic ministry, even its name, it's Out of Zion. Right. <laughs> um, and that, you know, I am functioning in that apostolic point. And I'll say that with a little a, not a capital A. And I'm not trying to put myself in the class of, of Paul, of Shaul, or Paul, the apostles. I wish I could, maybe one day. <laughs> but uh, that word simply means someone who sees out. And I know in the church, the word apostle is like a big deal, right? But see, in Israel, it's not such a big deal. Because see, the word apostle, it's a shaliach. It just means lishloach, to sin. You know, in Israel, we call the postman a shaliach. We call the postman an apostle because the post office sends the postman out to get your mail to your house, but they don't always do such a great job. <laughs> and so one of the other things you can pray is you can pray for a greater apostolic anointing upon the Israeli post service, right? <laughs> and then you might get some of your mail that you send us. So it's not such a big deal, but we were called to be an apostolic nation, an apostolic, uh, an apostolic people. And, uh, you know, there's probably, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 of us coming out from the land regularly. Now, they're not all coming with the right message. No. Right, Mike? No. <laughs> uh, sadly. No. Uh, and I'm doing my best. You know, I've, been, I've been struggling through this thing for 28 years as a believer. You know, sometimes swinging wildly from side to side. But I've, I've been out to the extremes. So if you've been out to the extremes, you kind of know somewhere, you know, you know approximately where, where the middle of the road is. And, uh, you know, I take it very seriously. That's why I spend so much time away from it. I take this calling very, very seriously. Because, you know, you've probably heard me say this before, but I mean it. When I stand before the Lord, I want to hear those words, well done. Yes. True and faithful servant. So I know what I'm called to do. I'm called to be a blessing and a light to the nations. And, uh, you know, I take, also take it very seriously in that if I'm called to be a light to the nations, what sort of light? Yes. Yes. Do I say, well, yes, God's a God of grace. You can do whatever you like. Or do I do my best to read the word and understand what God's trying to get across and then try to get God's word across to those who, who want, you know, who, who think they're on track with him and want to be on track with him, but because of, you know, because of the way the 
you know, the church has uh, yeah. traveled over the last 1900 years. Yeah. Most of the church is a long, long way away from where it should be. In fact, uh, you know, the, the problem is, of course, is that most of what we do in, in, in regular church is far more Greek than Hebraic. Absolutely. And I read a book by a guy, a guy gave me a book once, it was about the Greek influence uh, in the Western world. And uh, I don't have a lot of time to read books, so when someone gives me a book, I usually kind of flick it open somewhere just to get a, a feel of the author. So this guy gave me this book and I flicked it open and I arrived at this paragraph, and this is what it said if I can remember. He said, most of the Western world and much of the church is so deeply influenced by the Greek way of thinking that the train, <laughs> the train that we're traveling on long ago whistled past our stop and the destination of the train is not where most people who are on the train think they're going. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. And when I read that, it just hit me like a rock. Yeah. The train long ago whistled past the stop and most of the people who are on this train, uh, the, the destination where they think the train is heading to, it's not the one. Which is a very, and as, you know, as an evangelist, that, that, really, that really moves me and motivates me to try to help as many people as I can, make sure they get off the right train, or wrong train, and get on the right train, amen? Amen. Yeah. But the trouble is, most of them don't want to hear. If they, if, when they do hear, they want to argue with you about it. And, you know, um, I'd like to recommend, actually, all of you to go to, when you've got a, an hour, uh, go to YouTube and um, type in Jonathan Kahn, he's the guy that was teaching about the Shemitah, but he, he gave a message at the, at the MJAA, that's the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. Now, I don't agree with a lot of what they do there, but this guy gave a powerful message. Uh, and it's the Saturday, it's, it's this year, Saturday night, if you just type in Jonathan Kahn, MJAA Saturday night. And he starts off talking about a few of these other things, like the moons and that, but then, or the Shemitah, but then he starts to speak about the relevance of the restoration of the Messianic Jewish body. And just some of the things, I've got a few notes here, just some of the things that Jonathan said was that, and I've been, I've been saying this for years, so for me it was a, just a breath of fresh air, it was a, a confirmation of what, what I've been thinking now for, for 10 or 12 years, but he said that uh, because... Um, Messianic Jews, we like the meat and the sandwich. The, most, of the, most of the church doesn't like us, and most of the Jewish people don't like us. And the Jewish people say, most of the Jewish people say, you can't be a Jew and believe in Yeshua. But I've said for years, the true, the, the, you know, the true Jews, or the people that believe in Yeshua, are the true Jews. Because we know who our God is, and we know who our Messiah is. And, and that's what Jonathan said. He said, the true Jews well, you can't, he said, you can't be any more Jewish than to serve the, the Messiah of Israel, the Jewish Messiah. And he also said that, um, you know, we, the Jewish people, of course, are called to be a light to the nations, and we have been a light to the nations in many ways. But we can't really fulfill that. The only Jews that can really fulfill that calling to be a light to the nations are Messianic Jews, because we're the only ones who can show and shine the light of Yeshua into a dying church and into a lost and dying world. He also said that, um, you know, the re some of the purposes for the, for the restoration of the Messianic body was, number one, to call, they called to bring this, this, the, this church that's on the wrong train back onto the right track. Also, it's a preparation for the restoration of the authority of the kingdom back to Israel, specifically Jerusalem. And this, this really shook me when he said this. Uh, and I, I believe he said it in, the, in this conference, because a lot of those Jewish people that go to the, these conferences, yeah. they just like to play Jewish yeah. Yeah. on Saturday mornings, and the rest of the week you wouldn't even know what they were. Hmm. He said, the destiny and the calling on the Messianic Jewish movement is so big, or so huge, that most Messianic Jews and most Christians can't see it. They can't see why they're there at that meeting. They just want to wear the right, wear, wear what they think is the right clothing. They're not being about the Lord's business. And the Lord's business is for, for, for every Messianic Jew to be a, an, an, an apostle, whether it be to his own family or his neighbors or to the other ends of the earth. You know, actually, we're all called to be apostles. Because what was the last thing that Yeshua said? 
Go. <laughs> be an apostle. Get out of here. Go. As I said, it doesn't matter whether you go to the neighbor, you go to your family. Just go somewhere. And I remember, anybody know Keith Green? He was a radical, and I think he was a, he was a Messianic Jew, and he was speaking to a, a bunch of young kids on a, on a, in a park one day. On the, they were all sitting on the grass. And he said, in an army, in a, in, a, in a military situation, the general uh, rule is that you always follow the last order or command that your, your officer gave you, because in case something happens to him, what do we do? Well, you do the last thing, your commander told you to do. So what was the last thing our commander told us to do? Yeah. Go yeah. <laughs> into all the world and make Baptists and Anglican churches, right? Yeah. No? Yeah. What did he say then? Yeah. He said, go and make disciples. <laughs> and it's interesting, in the, in the modern New Testament, in Hebrew, the word for disciple is the same word we use for a, photo machine, a photocopy or a fax machine. What happens when you put, a, put some kind of document into a, into a photocopy or a fax machine if it's working properly? What do you get out the other side? Copy. An exact Copy. replica. Paul said it. Paul said, you imitate me as I imitate him. And you know, in America, I don't know if they do it here, but a lot of the young kids in America got these little, little um, wristbands, these WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, I'll tell you what you sure wouldn't do. He wouldn't sit down and have a ham sandwich for lunch. Talks a little bit quietly, it is. <laughs> you know, and of course, I think most Christians would acknowledge that you know, after worshiping the Lord, our next most, you know, the, the next priority is to become more like Yeshua. Amen. Absolutely. We want to become more like Him. It's a song, Lord. I want to be more like You. Well, if we want to be more like Him, be more like Him. But we have to understand that He was a Torah living, Torah keeping Jew. So they, they see it, but they don't see it. They're only they're seeing it very, with very, very thick glasses on. So, uh, you know, so the Messian, the, the, Jonathan was saying the restoration of the Messianic body, coming, particularly coming out of Israel, because that's the pattern. The, it's Isaiah 2 3, the, 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 the scripture verse for our ministry. For the, for the word of the Lord and the Torah shall go forth from Zion, from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Jerusalem to uh, reach our own people, to bring the church back on track, to prepare uh, for the kingdom's restoration to Jerusalem, and to, as best we can, reach out to a lost and dying world. And uh, that really is, if you think about it, that really is a huge destiny and calling. Uh, particularly if there's only 40 or 50 of us, right? I get tired just thinking about it. But the good news is what it says in Revelation 14. One day there's going to be 144,000 of us. Amen. Amen. And think about this, brothers and sisters. Back in the days of the early church, 70, 70 Jewish apostles turned the known world upside down. Think of, what the, think of the, the, the result of what will happen when there's 144,000 of us using our iPads and all this other stuff we've got, that, if it's still working in those days. But think of it, 144,000 on fire, Bible-believing, Torah-loving, Messianic Jewish apostles. There's something to pray for, isn't it? And really, that's a part of the, really the I believe the primary part of, uh, or, or, or the primary calling on the church, well, it's very clear from Scripture, actually. Number one, Isaiah 49, 22. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'll raise up my hand and oath to the nations. You could insert UK or Wales, England in there. They shall bring my sons in their arms, my daughters on their shoulders. There's a direct call from God to the church of the nations to help get the Jewish people home. Amen. Yes. And God doesn't just want us home physically. He wants us back in the olive tree. He wants us back sitting on his lap saying, Abba. Yeah. And so the other calling on the church is uh, Romans 11, 11. I'll, I'll turn it around to make it a little bit more clear. But it says, salvation has come to the Gentiles or to the nations. Or salvation has come to the UK. What for? To provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. And I think the third part of that, the third thing we need to get involved in is, is to pray for the, for the full restoration of the apostolic calling on Israel. And then we will go out and do what we're supposed to do. Every, the church will come right, the world will come right, and then Yeshua will come. And uh, really that leads me to back to the message. 
There's two things going on in the world today. Well, let me put it this way. There's two things going on in the Middle East, and it's beginning to affect the whole world. And if you don't believe that's true, I haven't got one around me, but uh, just try and carry a, a, a bottle of water through the security at, at, at the airport. You can't do it anymore. So um, there's two things taking place in the Middle East. <clears throat> it's affecting the, the whole world. Number one, God is in the restoration process of restoring Israel, bringing us hope, bringing us to faith, and sending us back to the nations in a preparation for his kingdom to, or for heaven to uh, release the Lord to come and for his, his, his kingdom to be reestablished on the earth. And the other thing that's happening, of course, uh, and this is what you see happening on your news and newspapers, particularly in the Middle East, but it's also affecting the whole world, uh, the devil knows what's going on. And the devil knows what's going on more than what most Christians know. know. And the, see, the problem is, the devil knows what's written in Acts chapter 3.21 and what the prophecies are all about. Yes. And, uh, you know, as I've been traveling to nations for the last 15 years, I've noticed two things that really stick out. And to use a, an old English word, I think you might know what it means, most some people don't, but uh, I have noticed a, 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 a dearth. You know what a dearth is? A dearth means a serious thing. There's a dearth of prayer Absolutely. in the Western church. Absolutely. And there's a dearth of Bible knowledge, Absolutely. particularly the Hebrew scriptures. Definitely. An absolute dearth, a serious lack of the knowledge of the word of God. And when they, when they do know it, they've read it with their Greek glasses on instead of their Hebrew glasses on. Right. Yeah. But the devil, he ain't got any glasses. The devil knows what's going on. And so everything that you see taking place in the Middle East against Israel, against the Jewish people, the rise of anti-Semitism, it's the devil trying to stop the second coming of Messiah. But I've got news for him, and it's not very good news. It's bad news. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we want to know who wins all this, you just open the last page of the Bible. You can see very clearly, God wins. Amen? <laughs> and if we are on God's team, we're on the winning team. Uh, so Acts 3.21 is one of those verses. The other verse that I wanted to talk about tonight, yeah, we sang it. Matthew 23.39. Yeshua said to the Jewish people in Jerusalem, You won't see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. And there's a type of this in the story of David. Because... Uh, uh, David was having a problem with Saul, and David and his men were hiding in the caves in the desert, and news came through that Saul had been killed. And so David's men went into, into David and said, uh, David's, uh, Saul's been killed, now you can go into Jerusalem and be the king. And this is what David said. David said, I'm not going to go into Jerusalem to be the king until they're ready to invite me. And that's exactly what Yeshua says in Matthew 23, 39. You won't see me again until the Jewish people are ready to say Baruch Haba, Hashem Adonai. Now that song, uh, well let's just go back there. You know, since 1967, the end of the Six Day War, the Messianic body has been in this restoration process. And there's a lot of musical talent in the Messianic body. I actually, this is just my personal opinion, but I believe that most Messianic Jews are Levites. Because, you know, the, when I first got saved, I thought, why me, Lord? And, I, and you know, still, we're still only a small number. I believe that those who are Messianic Jews today are really like the advance guard for when all of the Jews come into the... when God opens the eyes of all of them, because they're going to need some serious oh, yes. uh, discipling and pastoring, right? Or rabbi right. <laughs> So I believe that those who are Messianic Jews today, most of them, you know, our, 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 one of our purposes is to, is to be the priest to the rest of the Jewish people. And that, that's, a, that's a Levite calling. So in the months of it, of course, the Levite anointing is, is, is an anointing for worship because the Levites sang the scriptures. Now, I, I, you know, I think most of you know a lot of the very successful and famous uh, music world people are, are Jews. And I believe they're Levites as well. And so uh, the body began to grow in Israel to the point where we've got, you know, the second and third generation growing with these amazing musical gifts. And, you know, we've got, uh, uh, you know, we've got like our top ten hit parade of Messianic, you know, we sang some of them tonight. Some of them are a little bit old. We praise God for these, for these new ones that are coming on, right, Josie? Yeah. <laughs> Josie likes the new ones. Uh, I like some of the old ones as well. But we've got, we've got this amazing, uh, you know, we've got this amazing uh, pool of talent. 
And we've got this hit parade of local songs, and one of those songs is that song, Baruch Abba, B'Shem Adonai. Now the devil, he knows what this is all about. And see, I have a hunch that hell shook on May 14th, 1948. Because see, when Israel came back from the dead, hell knew and the devil knew that, hey, the Lord must be coming back very soon. And I think that hell shook again on June the 6th or 7th, 1967, as they won the Sixth Day War, which I'll rephrase that, as God won the Sixth Day War, uh, and Jerusalem was reunited, uh, hell shook again. Because the devil knew, hey, Yeshua must be coming back even sooner. And you may have heard me say this already, but I'm going to say it again tonight. I believe that hell shakes every Friday and Saturday. Why is that? I'm glad you asked me. Because that's when the Messianic congregations, 180 plus in Israel, 600 around the world, many in the UK, that's when we have our meetings. Excuse me. So from sunset on Friday to sunset or into the evening on Saturday, all around the world as the clock, as the, as, as the date goes, or the clock goes, there are Jewish people singing those words, Baruch HaBar B'Shem Adonai. And so I think that hell shakes on Friday and Saturday. And I just have this thought in my mind that as, as, now we don't all sing it at the same time, and we don't all sing it every week, but I believe enough Jewish lips are saying those words on, Saturday, on Fridays and Saturdays. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. The sound of that is wafting up to heaven. And the son is beside the father, sitting on the right hand of the father, right? He says, Abba, listen, they're singing. Can I go now? And the father says, no, hold on, hold on, son. He says, he says, there's still millions of my people to come back to the land. And I said, one day they'll all be back in the land. He says, only two or three, or no, it's not even that, only one and a half or two percent believe in you. And I said, one day all Israel will be saved. And then he says, I'm waiting for the other side of the family. I'm waiting for the church to wake up, to realize what's going on, to read my word, to know what's going on, read the books of the prophets, and understand what's going on. Instead of working against me, because that's what you're doing if you're pro-Palestinian. I don't even like to use the word. If you are pro-Palestinian, you are anti-God. Because those people, they want to destroy Israel, which will prevent the second coming of Messiah. And actually, what we call anti-Semitism isn't anti-Semitism, because the, the Arabs are Semites as well. What it is, it's the spirit of Antichrist. Because any, anybody, including your pastor, if he's one of these replacement theology people, anybody who is in favor of the other side is actually working against and delaying or, you know, the second coming. So it's not, it's not anti-Semitism. What it really is, the spirit of Antichrist. These are where you can pray. If you know people like that, I'm sure you all do. You know, you don't have to go and tell them David Silver said you've got the spirit of Antichrist. I'm in enough trouble as it is. But just say, just pray for them. And, and lift those people up. But I don't say, Father, in the name of Yeshua, I take authority. I lift up whoever it is. And I take authority over that spirit of Antichrist. And I bind it in Yeshua's name. And Father, release the spirit of truth and revelation from your word. And the other thing to pray against, of course, is the spirit of Greece. You know, not the Greek people or the Greek nation, but the spirit of Greece. Because the Bible says, I will raise, God says, I'll raise up your sons, O Zion, against the sons of Greece. So there's something, there's something between Greece. So there's two ways we can pray. And just see what happens when, when you do that. I, I believe it's a real key uh, to pray. And so anybody who is against the Jewish people living in the land that God said we can live in, it's not our land, it's his land, but he said we can live there. Anybody who's against, uh, you know, or just, let's put it the other way, it's more, it's PC. Yeah. It's PC to, to you know, it's not PC to be coming against Israel openly, but just by standing with our enemies, you're automatically, and Yeshua said it, because a lot of Christians actually, uh, they, they, they think they're in the middle somewhere, they don't take any side, but Yeshua said you're either with us or against us. There's no middle ground. In this. So for the father to say, son, I'm just waiting for the other side of the family. I'm waiting for the church to wake up and realize what I'm doing. And instead of working against me, they would work with me and just simply pray the word, the word of the prophets back, and I will do it. And at the same time, the sound of Jewish lips is wafting down, and all hell is shaking. And the demons are screaming out, hey, we've got to stop the restoration of Israel. We've got to re-divide Jerusalem. We've got to get the Jews and push them into the sea. 
And the Muslim world puts their hand up and says, hey, we'll help you. Oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> the wandering Jews are still wandering, right? <laughs> so the Muslim world, they've got their hand up and say, hey, we'll help you. Most of the politicians, the United Nations, most of the leaders, even the leaders here in the UK, they've got their hands up, hey, we'll help you too. The news media, hey, we'll tell lies, we'll give you know, unbalanced reporting about what's happening in the Middle East. And it works, so most of the world has got their hand up as well. And you know, I'm on the move again, Mike. <laughs> I can understand all of that, because the 1 John 5, 19, the Bible says the whole world lies under the influence of the evil yes. ones. But you know what I don't understand? Is that most of the church mm, has got their hand up as well. Most of the church is standing against what God is doing. And someone needs to tell them. Because, you know, if they don't change their ways, if they don't repent before judgment, they're going to be in serious, serious problem with God. And He is a God of love, and He is a God of mercy and grace, but He's also a consuming fire. And I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of the tracks, I wouldn't want to be on the wrong train on judgment day. So brothers and sisters, uh, please pray, along with what you're already praying, pre please pray for the Messianic Jewish people, uh, particularly in Israel, because you, know, you can pray for the Messianic Jews here to hear that whistle and go home, but once we get back to the land, pray that God will continue to pour out that apostolic anointing upon the, on his believing remnant there in the, in, in the land. And that the numbers will increase and that it'll one day, you know, we need to pray in the 144,000. That's what God, I mean, that's, I believe that's what God has called us to do. To, to partner with him, to co-labor with him, to, uh, as it says in 2, where is it, 2 Peter 3.12, to hasten the day yes. of the Lord's return. So it's nice to come to meetings like this whenever, but brothers and sisters, there's work to do. And uh, if, I, if, if Josie was going to say anything tonight, she was, well, one of the things she would say is, this is not a time to be silent, right? Why don't you say that? Yell it out. Yeah, well, I can say some more. Oh, come on, then. Yeah, yeah, they want to hear from you. Yeah. Why not? Definitely. And I'll have a drink of water. <laughs> we'll get that away. Yes, I would say that. Don't keep silent. You know, being um, British, my, my roots on my dad's side, I'm not Jewish, as you know, uh, are Scottish, so there's a little bit of British there. And we can tend to be conservative. And I know I was very conservative before I went to live in Israel. But living in Israel, you lose all of that because of Israel. So, you know, we tend to be a little bit shy and a little bit, like, timid. And we think we can't say this and we can't do that. But really, this is a day where we've got to let all that go. And uh, my message is that I believe God is calling us all to be a voice piece in this day. And I read, um, a few years ago, I read a very powerful saying by Napoleon and, and and I just thought it was amazing. It was very powerful and impactful. And I want to say it here tonight. Ten people that make a noise are more powerful than 10,000 that are silent. Amen. Yeah. And this, is, this, obviously, it speaks for itself. And so there's another scripture in Micah. Uh, I think it's four or five, and it says, Arise and thresh. It says, O oh, daughter of Zion, but, you know, we're all sons and daughters, so we can apply it to each of us. Uh, arise and thresh, or arise and work. Thresh means to work. Uh, and he says that, if you do that, I will make your horn like iron and your hooves like bronze. In other words, what God is saying in that, he says, if you arise and you begin to work and work with me, I'll anoint you, I'll empower you, I'll strengthen you to do what I've called you to do. And about a week ago, our family invited us over um, in the evening uh, to watch a documentary. It's called a movie, but it's actually a, doc a documentary called Above and Beyond. And it was produced by Nancy Spielberg, who is the sister of Steven Spielberg. So she's Jewish, and she's done it very, very well. And it's really a documentary about the victory that Israel had um, in the war that followed soon after 1940. And it's just amazing. I, you can get it on YouTube, and I recommend that you all watch it. It's about an hour and a little bit. It's not too long. It doesn't take a lot of time. And um, just like 
in the in the short version, it it just shows you how here's Israel like like a brand new baby really, and we have five armies nations that want to come and take the land back off us again. You know, one day we get it and we're dancing and rejoicing and singing and praising God. But little did we know that the next day and in the ensuing weeks, we were going to have five huge armies come against us. Now, it's a brand new nation. We had nothing. It's a bit like a baby being born uh, and the adult leaves it. You know, we're just there sort of floundering trying to get our... So, you know, you don't survive if you don't have um, a, a military or resources or uh, equipment. Uh, weaponry. We had nothing. We had no military. We didn't have anything. Well, Israel didn't know this, but uh, God's working in the background, and he was busy raising up four young Jewish pilots in America that said they didn't live in Israel. They had nothing to do. They, they'd never been there. They were born in America, raised, but they were Jewish, and they knew what was going to happen to Israel if nobody went in to defend it. They had nothing but their skills of being a pilot. They had no strategy, no plan. Well, God was at work. He began, there was a, a, like it was a clandestine strategy that God was working through these four only young pilots. And that you, if you watch it, you'll see it, but, but above, above and beyond. And beyond. Basically, what happened was that God provided planes, old check planes, were they old check war, war planes? No, no, Messerschmitts, actually, yeah. German aeroplanes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, four planes, and so they, they, they had this plan, and so they got it, look, they were willing. They said, we've got to do something, we're not going to remain silent, we're going to be, we're going to have an active voice. So they got in these planes, and they started flying towards Israel, and as they started flying over the desert, who did they see below them? The Egyptian army. Yep. Added, added once again. Whole army, the whole Egyptian army coming through the desert. So these four planes come over, they start bombing. They didn't bomb the whole Egypt, just a little bit of it. Well, the rest of the army, they look up and they go, oh my God, let's get out of here. The Israelites have got a whole air force. <laughs> so they retreated, they went back. Now, this is just four planes, four men. You know, God can make anything that's small if you're willing to look huge and defeat the enemies. What I'm, what I'm really saying is that you and you and you and you, each one of us here in this room, one person can make a difference. If we're willing and say, Hineni, here I am, Lord, you equip me, I'll arise and I'll work. God is calling us to be a, a voice piece, to stand on behalf of Israel and his people because there isn't anybody else that, right. that, that can do it. He could do it on his own. We know that he's Elohim, El Elyon, the Most High God, the God of the power above all powers, but he chooses to work with us and through us. We're the humans on the earth. If he comes in his power, we'll all be destroyed. <laughs> so he chooses to work through us. And I believe this is a day where we can be one person can be mightily effective. You know, we've got, David mentioned it before, we've got social media. Or we could be an active voice in, we could go to Israel, we could volunteer, we could um, uh, have intercessory prayer groups like you're doing here tonight and elsewhere. Or you can be your own intercessor in your own home, private and intimate with the Lord, praying. There are so many things that we can do to be effective and all we have to do really is be is be willing um, and there's a scripture I just want to read it out because I think it's quite appropriate and powerful I was looking at it just before it's in Daniel it's in Daniel 7 um, and I just want to read from 21 and 22 it says I was watching this is Daniel of course having the vision I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. In verse 18, just above.
12, it says, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and forever. You know, God has told us that we can receive the kingdom, we, we can possess the kingdom, but to possess a kingdom, you have to fight for it. We have to fight for what we've got. You know, I believe that this is a time also to be, to be radical, to be an extremist. Look at ISIL. They're radical. We need to be as radical as them for our God. They're radical for, for Allah. They're proud and they're radical in who they believe. They're extreme and radical in what they believe and what they're doing. They don't care what anybody thinks. You know, there's, there is a, they're, a vo they're a voice piece of, of who they represent, their organization, without stops. Not, and they're plowing through. They're, they're gaining ground. They're gaining parts of, of, of the kingdom. But listen, our kingdom and our dynasty is the kingdom of God, and we have to fight for it. Amen. So let's be a little bit more radical. Let's step out of our comfort zone of being shy and timid. And there's plenty of opportunities around where we can do that. And believe me, all this, we've got the easy part. We just have to either do something or speak. To me, that's pretty easy. And let God do what we can't do. Let him watch over his word to perform it. But it's got to kind of go out first, doesn't it? So it's a bit of a, um, what I'm saying is a, a challenge and an appeal. To arise and thresh. Let God fill us and anoint us and give us the power to do because we can do it and we can make a difference. That's the thing. We can make a difference and we can gain and possess the kingdom that Amen. belongs to us. Amen. Amen. So Israel, the key to the kingdom. God is at work, but so is the devil. And, uh, you know, we are in this, I believe we're in the, the last part of the journey. And all that the Lord is looking for is, as Joseph said, he's looking for the church to rise up, to, re to read the word, to know what God has said he's going to do, and simply just Pray it back to him, and he will do it. Amen? So, we just probably came and shared this tonight just to really try and hopefully motivate you to, to get on with it, brothers and sisters. Stand up and be a voice, voice piece. Be a human shofar, and just, uh, just you know, read the word and pray, and just, just ask the Lord, Lord, what is my specific part in all of this? So, let's just have a, maybe five or five or ten minutes of questions. Is that okay, Jill? Yeah, okay, anybody got a, quick, got a question? We'll do it as quick as we can. Yeah. Nice and loud. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, I was really encouraged by uh, your Prime Minister in the last 48 hours. Oh. Now, do you think he's become a born again Christian? No, he hasn't. Well, Not that we know of, anyway. Yeah. What, 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 what's the he said? The reason why I, I, I question it mm. is that he says we've got two hands. He was being questioned about, um, you know, about the, the security situation, obviously. And he says we've got two hands. We've got uh, 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 offer one hand to the international community.